Hi, I'm Chris Hedges for The Real News. Uh, welcome to part three of my interview with Robert Shear, the author of They Know Everything About You, How Data Collecting Corporations and Snooping Government Agencies Are Destroying Democracy. So let's begin a little bit with uh, the nature of totalitarianism. Um, I would certainly argue that you know, when government has the capacity to watch you 24 hours a day, uh, then you can't use the word liberty. That's the relationship between a master and a slave. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they use this power at the moment, they are certainly using it against people, Muslims, um, Occupy dissidents, environmental activists, and others, um, but they have that capacity now to use it against all of us should they decide to use it. Um, the storage of all of our personal information, this is uh, the classic or even the core definition of a totalitarian system where um, you have the ability, should you decide to criminalize an entire group of people, we spoke about that in part two, as Hannah Arendt mentioned, uh, to instantly sweep them up. Uh, and you, uh, in part two, talked a little bit about a kind of innocent discussion about the Federal Reserve. That's a kind of a very good example of how that happens. Um, I don't share your optimism. I think that we're already there. Uh, I think that at a moment of crisis, uh, whether that's environmental, whether that's financial, uh, whether that's an act of catastrophic domestic terrorism such as 9-11, um, these people are totally ready to go. And I would also want you to address a little bit, uh, you know, at this point, is there really a difference between corporate and governmental power? Um, I would argue that at this point they're completely fused. Okay, so let me take the first part. Um, I, I, I think the founders of our country understood exactly what you said before, and uh, that any government, any government has the capacity to become coercive, destructive, in the extreme. And they were talking about themselves. Right. And, and we should remember that the people who framed this debate in the Constitution had once admired the monarchy in England. Uh, because they thought it was tempered by the Magna Carta, it was tempered by uh, common law, it was tempered by restraint. And yet they felt the wrath of this king uh, when the colonies started to rebel, and they drew a very important lesson from it. But they had already learned that lesson from the collapse of the Roman Republic, uh, Athens to some degree, Greece, uh, Spain, uh, France, and they drew two basic points, I think. Uh, one is that you cannot be a Republican empire in the same moment. That if you are going to have meddle in the affairs of people throughout the world, foreign entanglements and so forth, you can't be a representative republic. Uh, that you will be re lied to routinely in the name of patriotism. George Washington in his farewell address, a document I would commend to anyone to read, uh, something he spent eight years thinking about because he was gonna be a one-term president and then uh, he, he kept it in his drawer and you know, it wasn't an address given uh, obviously on radio or television, but it was printed. Uh, and he consulted with Hamilton and Madison about it prior to his leaving after eight years. And it's a very thoughtful, document. And it, first of all, it basically argues that if, if the decisions that you expect people to make politically in a republic are not close to home, if they don't have information, if they're not informed, then it's not going to be a meaningful exercise. That the trick in, in, in representative government is not the vote itself. It's how well informed the public is. So that f those women in Iraq who held up their purple stained fingers voting the way the Ayatollah ordered them to vote, that's obviously a parody of a democracy. But so too is our current situation where a fear of an enemy, whether it was communism, uh, you know, as a monolithic, inherently expansionist phenomena, or terrorism as an undifferentiated uh, threat, uh, unexamined, lied to, lied about weapons of mass destruction, and so forth. It makes this whole idea of uh, representative government a parody. It's nonsense, and you have to. So the assumption the founders is, is you have state of freedom uh, is something that has to be uh, nurtured. It's fragile, 
people are not normally in a free situation. They were constructing a government and writing down rules for this government precisely because they thought it would wither. Remember uh, Jefferson's idea, you're going to need a revolution right. periodically to uh, fertilize the tree well, let me, of let me liberty. Let me just throw in there, Bob. I mean, they also recognized the importance of the press, the fourth estate, as a vital counterweight. Um, and through the security and surveillance apparatus, we have no mechanism anymore to investigate the centers of power. We right. cannot shine a light into the centers of power. Right. So, but because of that a sense of a foreign threat, so we have to just deal with that, first of all. And, and when they put in these freedoms, they didn't put them in as a luxury, you know, something you could only have in the best of times when you have no enemy. On the contrary, they were in an incredibly vulnerable position themselves. They just come through a revolution. They knew the English could return. They knew they had other foreign enemies. And yet they enshrine these protections, not because freedom is a luxury in the best of times, but a necessity in the worst of times. That you will not have truth drive out error. You will not, you know, as Washington warned, the postures of pretended patriotism. You will not have be able to stop these very same folks, Washington, Madison, Hamilton, from being bad people if you don't have the power of the people to check them, okay? So that was absolutely critical to their whole evaluation. The other is that people have to be given a zone of protection for their ideas and their effects. That's what the Fourth Amendment was about, that if you are just observed all the time, if you are out there and, and can't collect your thoughts, can't think the unpopular thought, can't read what you can, uh, you will not be a free people. It's the basic condition. And they understood or anticipated exactly what happened in Germany. You mentioned uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, who was famous for having talked about the banality of evil. And if I were to talk about the current situation in that historical context, we have reduced the exercise of representative government to uh, the most banal. Uh, we, we argue uh, uh, usually on an uninformed basis. Uh, we don't know what's really being done in our name with drone strikes right. or invasions or the dictators that we support around the world were lied to with impunity. Uh, you know, going back to the Vietnam War, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, I happened to write one of the first stories about it when they finally uh, declassified a document showing there hadn't ever been right. a second Gulf of Tonkin, and the government knew at the time, and the government lied to us at the time. Uh, we m recently, while I was writing this book, a, finally they declassed the smoking gun document. The media uh, didn't even pay much attention to it uh, on the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh in uh, Iran in the early uh, 50s. And it was clearly established it was done by our CIA at the behest of the uh, British intelligence acting on the request from the Iranian, Anglo-Iranian oil company, which is now known as BP right. uh, Production, and say, we have to get rid of this guy, Master Day. We know he's not an agent of the Russians. We know he's not an enemy in any way, but he's threatening to hurt our profit in the oil business. So, but if you didn't have that information, you thought, oh, there's this dangerous guy in here, Ron. We got to get rid of him, and then we get the Shah, and we got to get, you know, he's having some problems, and then now we got the Ayatollah. Where did he come from? Where did madness come from? Where did chaos come from to the Mideast? Oh, well, maybe these are monsters of our own creation. Maybe we like, are the like ones. ISIS. Yeah, or like Al Qaeda to begin with. Right. We re recruited these maniacs right. to go fight a basically secular government that happened, or we thought was too cozy uh, with the Soviets. So we, we, these are monsters. Well, if you don't have that information, the electoral process doesn't mean anything. Then you add in the power of money to corrupt it and distort the agenda and manipulate, and, and it becomes a charade. So then you ask me before. How could I dare be optimistic? And the reason I'm optimistic is that, one, I think people throughout the world uh, have embraced a notion of freedom and individual sovereignty. Uh, and uh, that they, there is pushback from so-called ordinary people. And we did see it with Occupy. Uh, we do see it in a, a revived uh, labor movement in some ways. You know, We see it with immigrant groups. Uh, Latinos demanding their rights, undocumented people. But we see it all over the world. We saw it in the Arab Spring. We see that, you know, actually uh, freedom 
liberty uh, are not abstractions. It's a part of being alive. Uh, you are a person of the church. Your father was a minister. You, uh, I think now you are technically a minister, yes. right? So the whole notion that we all have a soul and that the soul is to be held accountable by an almighty, uh, uh, that the soul has to, decisions are made, that the soul can be sacrificed, that ethics and morality are something individuals have to struggle about. Well, the struggle in the eyes of an almighty don't mean anything if we don't have an informed decision, if we aren't aware of what's being done. You know, we go along with torture, we go along with oppression because we're allied to, you know. Uh, so uh, these become real issues for people. What did I know? How do I know it? And we have true heroes. Where do people like uh, Daniel Ellsberg, who gave us the Pentagon paper, or Edward Snowden, or, uh, you know, uh, Bill Binney, uh, these people, absolute heroes. Uh, Jessica Lynch, who was pictured by the uh, Defense Department as a Rambo uh, figure fighting off the enemy. And then she wrote a book, a courageous book, in which she said, no, the government manipulated, our government manipulated me. They, uh, Pat Tillman, uh, who, the, uh, gr football player, you know, great career, and his brother Kevin, who's a professional baseball player, and they volunteer to fight Al-Qaeda, and they go, and he's killed in friendly fire, and the whole thing is lied about by the government. Well, my, my wife, uh, Nardo Zucchino, did a book with uh, Mary Tillman, Pat Tillman's mother, and, and Mary Tillman said, I'm not going to settle for your lies. My son was killed, and you tried to exploit him for propaganda purposes. He was killed with American bullets not by this enemy. And she has, for years, tried to get to the truth of the matter. So people push back. People embrace liberty. It turns out this may be the most normal condition of human beings, where they feel best, okay? Uh, and that's why even now, in this very uh, manipulated and uh, you know, controlled society, we play with the images of freedom through shopping, through choice, uh, and so forth. We entertain people to death with free choices. What movie? Well, and the facade we, of our electoral system. Yeah, the, that's true. But the, uh, the reason, I, aside from that, I think people do have a thirst for freedom and that, you know, uh, that this is worldwide. Uh, people do want to throw off the shackles of dictatorships. And you, we've covered totalitarian countries, the two of us. And we know uh, the reason you have dissidents, the reason you have people rebel, is they don't want to be controlled. When I would visit the old Soviet Union, one of the healthy things about it is that I never met anyone, even if they were a loyal member of the Communist Party, who told them Pravda, which his name means truth, told them the truth. They knew they were being controlled. We have a different problem in our society is that this is all wrapped in, in, in the cover of freedom and so forth. So we are lied to in a much more effective way. We know that. Now, why am I optimistic? I'm optimistic because we live in a world in which capitalism has moved to a different stage. And it no longer can be contained within the bounds of a nation. As long as we could have our big companies with, we are 6% of the world's population, but we got 70% of the world's resources. As long as we could, were the only ones who could make stuff and we could sell it internationally. We had a model of exploitation and sales and so forth where you could be loyal uh, totally and under the subservience of your own government or in partnership with your own government and go ahead and rip off the rest of the world. That's what the English did when they ripped off the oil of the Mideast. That's what we did when we sold stuff all over the world and invaded countries with impunity. But that's not the model we have anymore. The nation state itself is an anachronism in the eyes of many people. Uh, and, and what we have are these multinational corporations that have gained credibility by pretending uh, to be totally independent, free-form institutions. And, you know, so GE, which was once the most American of companies, and, you know, and uh, so the flag could be wrapped around. No, two out of three of GE's jobs are abroad, uh, most of their activities are abroad, and so forth. This was true, you know, obviously of the auto companies, uh, most clear of the information companies, the Facebook and Apple and so forth. Their growth has to come internationally. This market is saturated. And they have to have the, so in China, for instance, Right now, three of the top 10 in information companies, internet, are Chinese. Now, how is Google going to penetrate that market? The Chinese government tries to keep them out, and they can say, hey, they're agents of the NSA, they're agents of the CIA. So they play the nationalism card. Google tries to say, no, you can trust us. 
We really care about the people we're serving. So same with Apple, Facebook, Mozilla, Instagram, so forth. You have what you know, somebody like Marx wrote about as a contradiction of capitalism. And you can't be both. You can't claim that, hey, we want to go into China and photograph all your houses and hire all your people and sell you all this stuff. And we can do it. It doesn't matter that we're an American company. We're doing it for the interests of the Chinese people, our customers. And that's true in India. And that's true in Brazil, right? Oh, did we tap the, the phone of the elected leader of Brazil? Oh, did we tap the personal phone of the elected leader of Germany? Oh, did we interfere in your domestic politics? That wasn't us. That was the NSA. Okay, that was the CIA. Uh, oh, they were using our data. So suddenly the cat was out of the bag. You know, uh, this was the value of Edward Snowden, but it would have come out anyway. Ultimately, it was uh, coming out. And the fact is, wait a minute, Google, Apple, uh, Facebook, uh, you guys are really not independent multinational companies. You're actually old fashioned agents of your own state government. You are in cahoots with them. You are wedded to them. They grab all this data and therefore you are spying on us. Why should we go with you? We'll go with a domestic. We'll go with the devil we know, a domestic company. Right now, the main pushback we're getting are not from liberal democratic politicians. You know, they're not from people who claim they're interested in privacy on that end. They're coming from these multinational corporations. It's ir irony. If you look at where a, a section of my book is, is reprinted, like on Salon or on TruthDig, there'll be an ad from Google at the bottom from Google, not a Google AdSense ad selling you soap or something or a car. No, saying we have to save the internet. We have to control the well, NSA. You deal with that in the book, I mean. Yes, but, but the interesting thing is this is real because their business model is threatened by these disclosures. If it could have been kept secret, that'd be something else. But once it's out and people around the world know, so your biggest challenge right now to, if you're sitting there at the top of Google, these enormously powerful, wealthy companies, you're getting pushback from the but European do you Union. Them? Do you do I, believe them? Do I, I mean, believe do you, they're do you, concerned? Do you yes. think that they will actually separate themselves from the security and surveillance apparatus? Well, if they don't, then they will decline. Well, I asked Benny once if he encrypted, and he started laughing, because uh, I had been speaking back and forth through encryption to another country, and uh, they would only speak to me through encryption. And I said, Bill, you know, I think when I send an encrypted message, it's probably read faster than another message. And he agreed, he said, I don't encrypt. He said, and Julian Assange has said the same thing in cyberpunks, that he oh, said wow. in the short term, you can use mechanisms to stop them, but in the end, we have created the most efficient mechanism to create a worldwide dystopia. Well, first of all, let, let me disagree, and I actually, uh, uh, we should have Benny and we'll, we'll talk to him, but I think his position is a, a little different than, uh, I, I, as I indicated to you, I listened to him for the last, four days, right. um, there's two things. First of all, what they're doing is not efficient if the goal is to stop terrorism. or It's anything. not the goal. Yeah, That's not okay. the goal. But I mean, if the goal is to really do targeted... But well, that's not the uh, goal. You know it's not the goal. Okay, I, I agree. Okay. But uh, the other thing is, uh, if, if your purpose is to... Okay, so you're going to accept this not to get the bad guys. It's just to observe all of us, right? I'll agree with that. Okay, yeah. so let's take that. That puts you in opposition to what these companies are doing. And I'll give you a concrete example. Apple and Google and Facebook have all taken strong positions that they want to encrypt all of this right. mail. Okay. Now, if your goal is to observe everything we're doing and not just find some bad guys, that, that makes it maybe too expensive to do. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, this is the end of part three of my interview with Robert Shear, the author of They Know Everything About You, How Data Collecting Corporations and Snooping Government Agencies Are Destroying Democracy. I'm Chris Hedges for The Real News. Uh, and we'll be back with part four of my conversation with Robert Shear. Thank you, Bob.